Hello everybody, welcome to my monthly show. I started this madness years ago with chess.com. This is the first time I'm doing this show officially with just Chess Dojo. It's pretty cool. And um, the idea started ages ago was very simple and it's the same now, is that I want to use this show to encourage people to go over their own games and to focus on that activity as the best means for improvement, even if, through experience, we know that it's a very difficult process, sometimes more difficult for some than others, but a very difficult process to go through. And it's that emotional intelligence that you learn by going over your own games that makes you uh, a little wiser. And my hope here is that me doing this will encourage you to do that kind of work. And also um, that I might sometimes, maybe not always, but sometimes say something uh, that could stick with you. For example, I'm gonna begin by talking about some chess crimes. But before we go, let me uh, move to the next scene. We kind of get a table of contents. And, you know, during the show, I'll shift back and forth. And I always forget. So if I forget, just put it in big purple letters. <laughs> big purple letters um, in the side that I can see it. Because sometimes I forget and I start talking about some other game. In any case, this month's show is divided into three, let me bring my mic a little closer here, into three different categories. We got chess crimes, where I just wanted, you know, I, I, it's kind of a joke, but we're gonna talk about that a little bit. And then we got dojo battles. And what's cool is at the chess dojo, especially through our Discord channel, we have organized some great classical games and uh, we have several members playing it, and it's a little, it's just great. I mean, it's like this, um, let's call it an intimate format, and it just feels cooler because it doesn't seem like someone's going to be cheating against you, and the people know each other, and a lot of times they'll talk after the game, and some of the notes we have today come from both players, which is, I well, it's just great. You can definitely learn a lot from your opponent after the game. Sometimes, for example, after the game, you might think that your opponent was an idiot in what they said, but you can kind of see the position through their eyes. And that is oftentimes very interesting. Okay, and then we have a bunch of games that I classed as maneuvering. Games where I felt just the uh, ability to maneuver could be highlighted. Okay, so let's start and... Um, by the way, I just want to say uh, one thing I'm mildly nervous about is, you know, I did the show on chess.com for years, and what we did there is we had threads, and I don't think those threads are going to disappear, but, you know, to me, that I wanna, what I'm trying to say is they were worthwhile, interesting things that people can go back and look at and see how people... Uh, progressed in their annotations and just the annotations themselves to get a sense of, um, you know, uh, how to do it, whether you're a GM or you are a 1200. Okay, so let's start with the chess crimes. And sometimes I say mean things on the show, and um, I don't really mean to be mean, but the point uh, of sometimes being a little caustic for me is that, um, you know, I was yelled at a couple times and it was very helpful to be yelled at just so I could get a sense of what a certain stronger player felt was just a terrible thing to do and it was something maybe I shouldn't at all be doing. So, uh, you know, Craw, who submitted a game last year, month sent a note on the discord a little bit angry that i called his move here e takes f5 a chess crime and i just and then he you know gave a variation to say like look it wasn't so bad um you know like black's not winning anyway 
And so one of the things I want to stress with this example is, first of all, it's probably a draw anyway, uh, regardless of what you do, but it's definitely a chess crime to take on f5 because you unite, you, you basically turn uh, a connected pass pawn into two connected pass pawns. You turn, and, and the pawn on e4, which is kind of really a dud, turns into a real player in the ceremony and maybe even an accident could happen. So even when I say a chess crime, usually it doesn't even involve analysis. It's just something I can look at and be like, no, that was, that was not the right move, man. Not the thing you wanted to do. That, that's what a chess crime is. There's all, you know, yeah, there's all kinds of ways to make mistakes in chess, but the chess crime is truly just something that we don't want to see, right? It's just something that uh, you can tell right away by looking at it that it's wrong. Okay, so to give an example from this month, we're going to look at Marty's game. I'm going to pick on Marty a little bit here. Uh, There's an interesting game in general. Marty's been on the show for years, plays uh, went back in the day before the pandemic started. He was playing for, uh, not for, but in San, at the San Francisco Mechanics Club, their Tuesday night marathon, which I assume will take place again. All right, so let's get into this game. All right. Um, so, everything great so far, fine. And Marty's a little unhappy that dude takes on d5. Um, and, you know, we get this position, which interesting, I think it's actually a pretty interesting move, of course, to play CD, and we've got a Carlsbad. I've always felt, and we've talked on the show before, about how the positions where white gets to put the knight on E2, you know, it's so like the bishop comes out, E3 happens, bishop D3 happens, knight E2. That always has felt more dangerous for me, for white, because the F3 uh, pawn can get used. However... Uh, this is also a dangerous setup uh, for white. And I think on an earlier um, show, I talked about how you need to use the extra center pawn in some way. You know, the, the F pawn is nice to play F3 to dominate the knight and sometimes to get E4. But it could also be used as a Pillsbury attack with knight E5 and F4 in some positions. So very rich position, and Marty says he doesn't know what he's doing. It's okay. His opponent doesn't either. Bishop g5, knight d7, e3, and queen a5. So I guess we're now transposing to a Cambridge Springs, and bishop e7 would be more traditional, but this is okay. Knight e4, snip, snip h6, knight f3, and I think this is kind of transposed back to a, a kind of sort of regular line. Now, let's, before we uh, go on, I want to make a critique about some of, uh, many of the annotations. Um, the main, one of the main purposes in the annotations is for you to have the chance to uh, express in words what you felt was going on in the position at any given time, to describe the dynamics. And, you know, a lot of times in chess, you feel like you don't have the time to do that. It feels like, oh my God, I'm, I'm under stress and I got to calculate all these variations. And that's why going, you know, honing that positional skill or just positional awareness is really important. Uh, in your own game analysis. So, for example, here, I think it would be appropriate for Marty to write something like, oh, um, well, white definitely has the development advantage. I have a minor weakness on the light squares after h6, maybe a possible hook on the h6, i.e. maybe I'm going to get opened with g4, g5. But I'm compensated by the fact that this knight is in a cage with these pawns, and I've got this gorgeous, 
Gorgeous, Marty. <laughs> Gorgeous. Bishop on d6. Very important to say these things out loud. To say, look, that's his worst piece, and that's my best piece. Maybe some of you already know where we're going with this. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, h4 was played in the game, and I think it's a bad move, and I think it's kind of like, you know, Simon Williams talked people into just pushing the h-pawn in general, and uh, maybe that's how White thought of it here, just like, well, it's got to be correct. And if you could get g4 in, um, then I think it would be, by all means, an interesting way to play. So let's just say from White's point of view, there are many different ways to play it, the most natural being castle short. Let's call that the conservative way. And castles long, the ambitious way. And also kind of interesting would be just to throw in this move g4 before anything happens, you know, because the second knight f6 comes, it's not going to be as easy. But you can imagine even castles knight f6 even h3 here, intending this kind of thing. Okay. Anyways, h4, we don't know. Knight f6, good move. Knight d2, no one knows. He doesn't, like you say, he doesn't need it in order to play e4. And let's just say from his perspective, if he wants to play e4, that's totally fine. And one of the things we should say about it, and even write about it, in the notes is white should think about playing e4 to fix the knight on c3 and then you know give you further compensation marty with a uh, isolated queen pawn okay bishop d7 you're right bishop e6 feels a little bit more natural bishop f5 weird right and so one of the things we're seeing is that white is squandering his development advantage. He's not doing anything. Nor, I'm guessing, does he feel uh, how, uh, how much he needs to do something to activate the knight on c3. Okay, so here we go. Bishop f5, queen d8. I don't get it. I don't get it, Marty. Why are we, why are we going over there? I mean, think about it this way. The guy played h4, so now, wouldn't it be nice if your queen was hanging out, just talking to his king a little bit over there? Looks good to me, right? Looks good to me. So what's the most natural move? Well, I guess castles. Why not, right? So here you squander a tempo, and I think, I guess just judging from what you do next, your intuition is like, well, let's trade off f5 and play queen d7, uh, which we're going to call passive because he's not really doing anything to you over there yet and there it happens white says no you castle very good king b1 all right here we come to our featured chess crime of the day <laughs> where marty commits a chess crime and i i organized it like this just so that craw wouldn't feel so bad you know i wasn't trying to pick on him but this is another example where i see this move and the and its intention and i'm like immediately oh god <laughs> oh god this is a chess crime and like the fir the previous example it's not a crime that like instantly loses or loses you know all hope of winning the game or anything like that it is simply a chess crime okay let's look at boom horrendous move <laughs> horrendous move and i think it's born out of this thing that happens sometimes where people look at a position like this and they're just like, gee, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And something I notice with players of various levels is, you know, you got to think about building the position oftentimes. And that's sometimes a real difficulty for people. So the building move, would certainly be king b8. And bishop b4 is a crime because you're really intending to take the knight. Now, I could tell you that the actual taking of the knight was a real mistake, but since it's your intention, it's already set, right? Because that knight is a, though, man, 
White definitely would want to invest Mini Tempe to fix that knight. F3, okay. Now notice this plan with F3 dominating the knight, not bad, but it's not really consonant with the H4 move, right? Snip, there's the crime. Okay. Now, B6, now your position's a little loose, and notice, now your knight on F6 is terrible. And um, things get a little creaky. I like how he's playing. Now he's better. And what he did, of course, was he made his own little crime, which was he uh, forgot to... Well, I mean, maybe... Well, okay. A4 is only correct if the coming ending is something black really wants excuse me, white really wants. And if he's going to do it, then he needs to go for it right now. Let's, you wrote this variation. Let's just take a quick gander at it. And uh, mm, mm, you know, if the knight weren't hanging, I guess, maybe, uh, yeah, if the knight weren't hanging, we could play rook c7 and claim something. But unfortunately... So this is nothing for him. And why is it why is it bad for white to trade the queen's bill? Because our king was the one doing a little bit of operation here. Right? Uh, okay. So, almost anything else. Queen a4 for him. We get this position. And... Um, let's call this at least good in intention. 98... Interesting. And you did a, a nice variation here, knight b5, snip, snip, snip. And it turns out that you have interesting play activity, right? And that's what you should look at here. And then I don't know how you drew this game, Marty. <laughs> I don't know how you drew this game because this is god awful now. Let's see how it goes. Maybe my memory serves me wrong and you didn't draw this. I think you somehow did draw this. Uh, n not the greatest. Yeah. Oh, maybe you won this, Marty. Oh, man. Yeah. So all kinds of madness happened. A lot of people ask me, how do I, how do I improve? Well, the answer, the easy answer is if you want easy improvement, learn to play endgames. It is, especially Rook endgames. You could check out my video. I did a video on the uh, on Rook endgame test. I'll try to do more Rook endgame videos. But in general, the Rook endgame is very hard to learn. And at all levels, um, you know, it is the easiest way to make progress because no one gets it. No one gets it, and you saw it there. It's very, it's a skill to learn, and I definitely, like everybody else, had to, to learn it myself. And why was so disgusted with himself that he resigned. <laughs> so that's how he won. <laughs> that's how Marty won this game. Okay, so I'm going to try to take a look at the notes, but I might not always get there. All right, now let me go briefly to show you these battles here. So, um, yeah, in these next battles, these are all, both players um, are playing in some kind of dojo event. It could be, we have a ladder, that's just something you can join and anybody can play in it. Or we also have tournaments, round robins organized. And there we got some pretty tightly matched people there, and we've got some great games going on. Some great games definitely here too. In these ones, it's not always that both players are going to annotate the game. In some cases, it's just one, and I believe that's the case for the first one here with Paul's game. All right, let me go back. Paul is notorious for being pessimistic about all of his chances whatever game he's playing and um, as a New Year's resolution to try to be a little bit more aggressive, he's gone from calling himself 
Paul in New Jersey to Paul 1E4. Good. I like it, Paul. All right, here we go. Okay, interesting opening. And here, white is going to aim for H4 in a way that makes a lot more sense. And um, the thing about it, though, that's interest that for me is, well, let's just look at what happened. In hindsight, it's not clear the bishop wants to be on e2. So, for example, if that's the case, then maybe black should, if white wants to do it, play it now. And this would just give Paul kind of a heart, heart attack kind of question to answer, namely, does he want to allow this kind of thing? Now, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But see, the point is you can hang it over him and then White can decide if he wants to go for that exchange sack too. Um, yeah, give Black the question. In any case, if h5 um, instead, then it might be more logical to put, I think it is more logical to put the bishop on d3. Okay, so one thing I've noticed about these kinds of games is which I do believe h5 is correct here, is that white, if they cannot achieve g4, which I don't think white wants anymore, then they should shift focus to the fact that they've won a glorious square on g5 and that a lot of the you know, positional squares around black are tender now. Like g6 might become a target, and that's why I kind of, I'd, I think I want my bishop rather on d3 now. But okay, so one of the things we're going to see with white is white is obsessed with playing g4, but don't think it's really going to happen. That's why he's putting the knight there. Now, uh, Paul writes, I didn't know why the knight went to h3 instead of f3. I know. I'm a chess. <laughs> I'm a chess. I know these people. I know my people. And right, Max is dreaming of some kind of g4, and only later does he realize it doesn't really work out. Good move. Okay. Bishop f5. Well, why am I a little critical? Because it's not clear it belongs there. You ask yourself, what do we know for sure? Well, it's knight c6, right? So, um, yeah, knight c6. And then we'll see what he does. We have no idea what he's going to do. In general, always make the move that you know you're going to make. I don't know about that move. I thought queen b6 was okay. Um, yeah, it was fine. You gave it a quite uh, like a funny move mark. I thought it was okay. Now let's talk about this position. Um, here, uh, I would be disappointed as White to be trading the queens because what is my knight on g five doing then? And what is this like overpowering like thud going on on the king side? What is it going to be about if I'm going to trade queens? So I think when you're writing about this game, Paul, what I would want to hear is like, well, now we're going to try to move to a, a way of playing as black where we're going to try to play against the awkward pieces. So for example, no one knows. No one knows. No one really knows what they're doing after the queen trade. I don't know. So you can try to imagine opening up something on the queen side. All right, now let's look. Takes. I also, I'm with you. I don't really like it, but that isn't, that isn't the problem. All right, A, B, and now C, D. That's definitely more problematic, though, to take. And the reason is, in general, actually, this... Hopefully, I've seen this with a lot. I have some students who play the London. I hope Vishnu will forgive them. <laughs> and um, this mistake is often played by the black players 
And the reason it's not great is after ED, the structure is an, a minor improvement for White because he can start dreaming of playing down the E file, whether the pawn's on D5 or D6. Uh, and if you want to think about it in a really simplistic way, you can say my pawn on C5 was more powerful than the pawn on E3. Okay. But white took back with the knight. A mistake. And you took on d4, saying I couldn't allow knight c6 because after bc6, I have a weak isolated a pawn. Well, no. No, think about it. The, the knight on d4, no one knows what it's doing. And uh, you taking back c6 is no problem. Um, and the, I guess the easy, there's more than one move here for you, but to me, the easy thing to do would just, just go back here. And if he does take on c6, I don't know which way. I mean, they both look good to me, the pawn and the bishop. But look at his pieces. They're all funny. No one knows what the knight is doing on g5. The bishop's hitting a rock, you know, and he's got to worry about e5 getting shut out entirely. So I don't think that was necessary. And now you do an instructive mistake, and I think you are correct in noting it. So a6 castles b5, and I'm pretty sure you're motivated by like uh, some dream of minority attack. Um, do I think you're worse now? Well, I don't know. As long as that knight's still over there on g5, I'm not too worried about yourself. Um, and white plays rook a5 is a little bit of a heartache. And you got frisky. And uh, your opponent didn't like it. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting. It's definitely uh, frightening to me. So let's take a look. Boom. Rook fc8. Now maybe some other move instead of that. Maybe knight d5 was better. Um, and now c4. Which does not look right to me. c4 doesn't look right. I'll tell you what. If I was black, the thing that would scare the you-know-what out of me would be could white have played snip snip and then you know we're gonna take this thing we're gonna play this thing and then i'm yeah i'm scared to death <laughs> i'm scared to death <laughs> so that would have been the very frightening thing that just intuitively even though the knight is so terrible on g5 uh i would be really worried about as black and that's the kind of thing Again, I'll chastise you guys for the notes. That's the kind of, you know, experiment you should go through in, in your thinking. You know, like, just ask yourself, how do I feel about that? Okay, c4. Now it's going to get spicy. Now, of course, c4, what is the problem? The problem is that the knight's still over there on f3, and no one knows why. And now... White structure is dramatically loose. Bishop b3 takes. Do I understand this? Not really. Do I think maybe bishop d5 or something here? Probably. So, bishop c4. I, don't, I actually have to admit, I don't understand this game. <laughs> Rook takes. I don't know what happened here, Paul. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand, Paul. <laughs> what happened, bro? Wait, bishop b3. Now, this needed more annotations, Paul. This needed more annotations. So first of all, bishop c4 takes, rook takes, rook takes. There's no way that we're playing rook takes a6 here, Paul. No, no, bro. 
You got to, I mean, rugby eight's like forced, right? Unless, no, you need to play rugby eight, son. Yeah, and you still have chances of holding things off. Why? Because these pieces aren't working yet. But if you connect as junk, oh no, man. <laughs> oh no. That can't be good. Yeah, and I don't know what you're doing taking those pawns over there, Paul. I don't know. Okay, so lots of instructive mistakes, Paul. Um, I think you're not, I think you're playing with a little terror still. But look at this, for example. There, you still have the pessimism. <laughs> look at the note. I already knew I was lost. Paul is famous. Paul is famous throughout Chess Dojo Land for being, and for me too, for being incredibly pessimistic about his positions. One thing I want to stress is that a lot of times in uh, the analysis when I teach or also in this show, people really feel terrible when they feel like They've got some structural weakness. When you look at this position, though, you got one problem. It's the pawn on a6. Black, white has problems, too. The bishop on f4 isn't working. The knight on g5 isn't working. So you have every hope of still doing this here. You know, knight d5 looks fine to me. Looks fine to me. Yeah. When you think about it, I don't even know why you're worse. Knight d5, I don't know where the bishop goes. Let's, let's put it here for a second. Knight c7. You ask yourself, Paul, why are you worse? Let's say he goes over here. I don't know why you're worse. You go over here or something. And um, what, is, what are his rooks doing? No one knows. No one knows. That, that's just an approximate variation. But in general, he's got pieces that don't work. There's no, there's no need for the... Old Paul. The old Paul in New Jersey was scared. He was playing scared. Thought his position was lost all the time and he didn't know how to play good chess. You were fine here, bud. You were fine. All right. Let's go to the next one. We're at scene two. And uh, this is going to be Vishnu and Lawrence. This is a great battle coming up. And Vishnu... Uh, this is actually Lawrence annotation. Vishnu religiously submitted his games to the show for years. And um, the thing about it now, with Vishnu's, Vishnu's got a life. <laughs> Vishnu's got a life. And I think he's moving back to India, and I think maybe the chess is going to go on the down low for a little while. In any case, so here we go. And I'll, I'll flip it because it's actually from Black's perspective. Very dynamic, and um, again, I think it would be helpful to talk about what the dynamics are. And, you know, for me, it's all about White sacrificing his development and a lot of his structure when we think about the C4 square for the love of the bishop and the love of space. And this is one of the most complicated positions uh, of all time. And one thing that's interesting, I, I looked at a different Samish position that Smyslov had. I've been going over Smyslov games in the morning. And uh, I remember there was an earlier computer. I don't know when it was or which one it was, but it was like 10 years ago. And it was just like, Samish, you're done. <laughs> It'll never happen ever again. And I turned on Stockfish 12 in, in a slightly different position to this one. Uh, without the F3. And um, it, it was like, no, nah, Black's, but, you know, equal game. Really interesting. So anyways, this is uh, a very ambitious, this, this is the most ambitious way for uh, White to play. So here we go, 98. Now this move is a great move. Um, I'm sure you could do other things. Um, but it's played with the wrong understanding. Um, my sense is Lawrence has seen this move 
in other GM games, some form of it. And in his mind, it was about stopping bishop g5. And the thing that's hard to understand is bishop g5 isn't necessarily all that because the bishop never wants to get traded. This is his glory boy over here with bishop g5. That's his stunner. If you're if you're black and you're thinking about, hmm, how am I going to get hurt in this game? Well, it's by that son right there. That thing. That thing is something we got to worry about. But because it's like, imagine bishop g5 and bishop takes f6, gf. That's not our worry. We'd love to have that if he'd give us his bishop. So what is knight e8 about? Well, let's look. Knight h3. Well, we, I, I would have wanted Vishnu to play e4, but we'll get to that. And now d6. So, incorrect. Wildly incorrect. And um, the point of 98, uh, this was developed in the 50s in response to, I think it was, yeah, Botvinnik was playing like this same -ish stuff. And the key point of 98 is not only... Do you not have to worry about bishop g5? And sometimes you do have f5. But that later, the knight's going to come here and talk to c4. And basically, I think a good way to understand black's approach in this game, in this opening, is you are aiming not so much for the pawn. Pawns aren't really that important. You're aiming for the square. If you can conquer that square, it will be a real thorn in white side and will make his attack more difficult. So what is 98 about? So, you know, the general plan was something going to be something like this. C5, B6, Bishop A6, Knight C6, Knight A5. And then if you need this friend, if you need him, then he comes to finish the job off with Knight D6. Now, it doesn't mean black's winning or anything. It just means, like, that is the real struggle right there. So d6 is a bad move, which really limits um, black's opportunities. Now, for example, if you wanted to play d6 here, I think that's totally fine. Totally fine. In fact, I did a, a video called The Flamingo where I said... You know, if you ever want to play e6 and knight f6, you play bishop b4, you could trade your bishop, then you play d6 and e5, and you're basically okay. Could he have done that here too? Yes, yes. But it's what I'm, it doesn't work with knight e8. And now the knight on e8 is like, wait, bro, why did you play, did you play d6? Right. Okay. Chester's asking, don't we have to contest the center? It is possible to play things like d5 here, but the horror, the scary part, is that actually we looked at a Carlsbad not too long ago, and it, similar ideas here where the knight is dominated and you're going to have to worry about e4. And you know, you, you, you have lost. <laughs> you have lost the center fight, but you could play this way. This is also possible to play this way. All right. So I want Vishnu to just play e4. And then also here, I want Vishnu to play e4. He's holding back for reasons I don't understand. The Our friend here, sometimes, you know, in the same ish, you get e3. You know, but it, especially after this, after 98 d6, dog, it's time to start moving on this guy. He's he's given us some important tempi with this d6 move, and it's time to start murdering him. Now, I'll say this about knight h3. I don't think it's bad, but Vishnu's going to have to be clever about how it comes into the game, right? So, like, for me anyways, the development with bishop d3 and knight e2 feels... Well, a little bit more natural, but I'm sure this is fine. It's But definitely e4 instead of e3. Okay, here we go. Boom, boom, boom. It's all happening except the knight's not coming. Queen e2. Okay. Funnily enough, what do I want? I want Vishnu to play 
e4 or f4 for that matter i need but i need the party to start i need the party to start right now and queen e2 well i guess we're waiting for knight a5 <laughs> okay rook b1 i don't like it and interestingly i think vishnu is holding back because he's like unsure of what to do whether it's like e4 or f4 and rook b1 no it's not doing anything over there it's not doing anything so um yeah it's another loss of time and let's i think it you know you don't have to be a genius when you're looking at this position to say oh my god time is going to be really important it might be hard to see how the outlines of the attack are going to come but it will certainly come all right c5 d5 it would be really nice if we could play knight d6 right now right okay am i thrilled with d5 no I, of course, I want to see something like e4, but Vishnu is scared of some kind of, uh, you know, takes, takes, um, rook c8 thing. Okay. f4 is also interesting. So here we go. Boom. And then no notes about e5. I wasn't convinced about e5 necessarily. There's a variety of things that black can try to do depending on what degree of fear he has for his soul in this position. But he could certainly consider taking on d5 and taking on d3. In any case, here we got e5, e4, and Laurent writes that he expected f4 and certainly makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And in general, the only fear for white when you play f4 is can black get a knight to e5? And the answer here is no. So definitely, right, I want f4 to happen. Um, good. And here it is. Laurent goes all in. Now, this happens a lot in this kind of variation where white needs to kill before he gets killed on the other side of the board. Okay, so Vishnu takes, and let's say that this is a really important moment. The drama uh, about taking is that you are liberating this square for the night, which is... It's, as we've seen, <laughs> as we've seen, it's been a big problem for black uh, for a while. Okay, so let's say that there were several other moves that we want Vishnu to consider here. Um, we've got knight g5 is a very natural move. Uh, another interesting move is rook b5, sacking the exchange. And let me be clear, material is no longer important. Right? It is just not important. And rook b5, I don't know what the evaluation is, but it would be hard because the queen, the black queen, would really be cut from her man. And, you know, white does have a massive force count over there. And the knight on e8, no one knows. No one knows what that guy's doing. But after white takes, now black does know what he's doing. And now queen h5. And again, I think knight g5 is more scary. Um, let's just put that on the board for a second. And these are the kinds of variations I guess I would want to see. Um... So, you know, f6, no bueno because of knight e6. Bishop c4 is cer certainly a thought, um, but I assume it's going to go something like bishop c4, queen c4, and then queen h5, and we got ourselves a problem, Moscow, <laughs> you know? And so, looks good to me. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, looks great. I, I don't get it. If h6, well, you know, 
in addition to the obvious knight f3, I think there's, yeah, well, the, at the very least, there's the obvious knight f3. There might be more spicy stuff as well. Okay, so this didn't make sense. F6. By the way, you know, I one of the things I want to stress is um, go in terms of learning to go over your games. Uh, for future shows, what I'd like to see is more description, of course. I talked about that. But here, you know, yeah, you could do pages and pages of analysis. And if you do, you'll get a real good sense of how to look at the position. And, um, yeah, you, you get a sense. Now, here's a really spicy moment. Uh, boom. And then he says, almost forced. And uh, there's no, thing, no such thing as almost forced, you know? <laughs> you don't know. It's like almost some other crime. No, it's either a crime or it's not. But right, we get it. And do I think White's totally lost after this? I do. But somehow Vishnu wins this game. Let's take a look. Boom. And unfortunately, there's no queen h7 because queen d1. And now black's just winning. Uh, I wanted him to bring the lady back. They give a variation. Didn't convince me. Uh, right. Um, like here. Well, I, I would definitely be thinking about bishop c4, right? So, does he write about bishop c4? Let's see. No, I don't think so. Am I, maybe I'm missing something dramatic, I, but bishop c4 looks like the move to me, right? Because when you take with the knight, you, um, you pin yourself, right? And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, no. <laughs> now we got ourselves a little bit of a problem over here. Now, maybe we're still winning, but it's starting to scare me. Because we got to worry about that. And oh no, nice move, Vishnu. And throughout the years, Vishnu has created nice chances in positions like this where it just got messy. And, you know, I did this thing, a video about a week or so ago called A Path to Follow. And, um, you know, I told Vishnu on the show, I was like, dude, you know, you're playing like, um, you're, you're playing like sheer off and stuff. And, one of the things about this kind of player is they're comfortable with the madness, right? You know, you're gonna get, you're gonna lose control. Great example, MVL lost control today. <laughs> he lost real control and ended up winning that game. Some people more com comfortable with losing control. Fabi is very comfortable with losing control. And now I guess it's done. Something, something's terrible is happening. I have a feeling White could have done better. Wait, wait, I'm, I'm going too fast. I'm going too fast. Wasn't there some knockout blow, Vishnu? Wasn't there a knockout blow here, buddy? Hold on. Um, Maybe I'm just, I, I guess I'm missing it. Uh, huh, okay, I'm just going to trust them and say that E6 was forced. <laughs> I kind of doubt it, but I'm trusting them there on that one. We're going to say this is heavy time pressure, in which case the drama that's about to unfold makes a lot of sense. Check to the miserable king. Very nice finish mission. Okay, great. Let's do next game. I'll switch scenes and I will not forget to go back. This is Chesterfish against Scott Harkema. And both these guys I've played 
Uh, I've played Scott a couple times just for fun. Sometimes I'll go on Twitch and just play the people, you know, play some, and just we're just hanging out. So I've played Scott a couple times over there. And we've had Chester Fish quite a few times on the show. So let's check it out. We'll do it. Chester Fish did the annotations, so we'll stick with him. Okay. Boom. And in general, I think this is a, well, let's call it a minor inaccuracy. And um, the easy way to understand it is you are violently opening the position now without fixing your bishop on c8. And um, there are several problems, actually, with this particular move order. I mean, let's say the obvious. Normally, white castles here first. Um, and so, in a, there's the obvious question of what's going on with CD and then DC. But also even DC, and then when he takes back bishop c5, the bishop is loose and funny business on c5. So, um, yeah, definitely good for white in this position, but he blows it with knight c3. And then black gets some play now. And, I mean, at the very least, black's now okay, right? So here we go. Knight b5, a6. Chesterfish says in the in the chat that it was prep. It's still bad. <laughs> it's still bad. <laughs> DC or CD are going to give... I think DC is definitely... You know, it's kind of weird, actually. Because Queen... Well, I'll just say Queen C2 is a weird move instead of castling. Maybe, actually... Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll be ready to be corrected. A lot of times, by the way, I'll say stupid things here, especially about openings. And people are like, what are you saying, Carl? You don't know what you're talking about. It's... it's it's totally normal, that, you know, usual for me to make a mistake with the openings. Now, this is definitely, does not feel right. Definitely knight c3 was wrong. That doesn't feel right. And you write about knight c6, looks good too. a6, that looks weird. Definitely, Scott, you got to play knight a3, bro. You got to play knight a3 and maybe you have some compensation if he wants to play bishop a3. But that doesn't look good. And definitely, I mean, if I'm white here, I'm just like, I'm probably lost after that. I'm probably lost. You know? And then it's up to black to figure it out. It looks, looks terrible to me. <laughs> it looks awful. Okay. Boom. Oh, yeah. He gives his variation. And then... Rook c7 as a variation. Yeah, something like that. It's just a, a, a pin of death. A pin of death. All right, here we go. Knight c6. Knight a3. Bishop a3. Now, was it necessary? Maybe, um, I'm going to go ahead and say bishop d7 is a very pleasant position here. Right? Yeah. Actually, you wrote that too. You wrote about bishop d7. So this whole thing, if Scott is watching, or maybe he'll watch, we have, we'll post this on the YouTube later. Uh, it's important to see that what you're doing is artificial, especially with queen a4, right? That is a very artificial move where your pieces have gone really funny, where you're trying to justify, I, I presume, getting this pawn back. And in the meantime, black can just develop all this stuff. So bishop a3... B a3. Now notice, you could have done knight a3 at the very beginning, and then the queen wouldn't be misplaced. Knight a5. Let's read what uh, Chester wrote. I spent 14 minutes on this move. Good. It's definitely a critical position. I think my position was close to winning, probably. Pawn structure, development, extra pawn. Saw the opportunity to play queen e5. Looks like a good position. Um, so I played knight a5 because I thought I had calculated accurately 
that I could hold on to the pawn and develop the queen side with b5, which gets a tempo on the queen, allowing me to develop the c8 bishop. I missed some details. Um, okay. So let's consider this um, and say that something I noticed, Chester, in the coming business is that for the sake of this pawn, you lose your development and you allow your pieces to become uh, passive. And when we look at this position, you got to say to, you know, if White's looking at this, he's like, well, all right, the pawn hurts me, the development hurts me, my queen's weird placement hurts me, and maybe I'm going to survive with something like... Uh, a4 someday, and then the beast on C1 will rise from the grave. And uh, I want to say that, you know, just like first glance, on the first glance, the thing you could do, which doesn't require too much thinking, would be just boom, boom, and then smack him here. I don't even know what the evaluation is, but I do know that's pretty nice for you. Right, because you'll get the c4 square and you know the whole thing, and your development's better. Okay, now what you did, I don't know if it was technically wrong, but it's just a little ugly. Now, let's read what you wrote because bishop b7 was certainly your intention, and uh. Yeah, let's just consider it. So, queen c, uh, right, bishop b7, rook d1, and now queen c7, and we're worried about bishop f4, e5, bishop e5, and bishop f4 will be the move you missed, I get it. Queen a5, bishop g2, king g2. Um, and looking at this position, just intuitively, I would say, you know, you got to say you're doing great. You know, it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, centralized queen, huge pass pawn on c4, possibilities for all kinds of drama. And, you know, you could see this position from afar and tell yourself, all right, I'll figure it out when I get there. Two. So what's interesting is you have to weigh this position in your mind with the pawn clutcher <laughs> variation. I'm going to call it the pawn clutcher variation because you do the pawn clutcher here. You play knight b7. And I want to say that even if the computer told you that that was a good move, you still shouldn't do it, you know? I mean, in the game, you're not going to know <laughs> if the computer tells you it's a good move. It just looks so bad. And it also... The possibilities for terrible, terrible things happening to you here are just, they're big, you know? And I don't want terrible things to happen to you. No. <laughs> we don't want any part of it. So one thing, when you compare those variations, it's kind of interesting. Like just, just looking optically at knight b7 and then this one. Because I get it, you missed bishop f4 in your original intentions. But then you reconsider and you say, okay. You look at this thing, you say, well, this one, this one's just pleasant. Now, you don't, very little risk, very little risk. And the other one, you're, you know, you're risking stuff. I don't even know how to evaluate this position that we get with knight b7. All right, rook d1. Oh, he didn't play rook d1. Um, and in fact, uh, in addition, I don't understand Sharkema here. Hold on. Maybe maybe I got to look at the notes to understand what Sharkame is up about here. Bishop f4. Um, I don't understand. Why wouldn't we play rook fd1? Anyways, if I was black here, if I was white, I would say I'm probably back in the game because I got rook d1 and I got a4. Both of those moves are things I want to do. Right? A4, A4, I feel like I'm not risking anything after that. Okay, so, 
boom, boom, boom. You're still not out of dodge. And then you correctly, I think, write about bishop d5 here, which is what Scott should be thinking about. Basically, Scott has a brief moment before you start uh, mobilizing your stuff, and instead he mobilizes you. Oh my God, he gave you that. <laughs> right? He gave you that. Oh no. What are we doing? And now you're just totally winning. Now it is crispy critters. And uh, can we talk about knight d8? Mm. I don't know. Maybe I should have put this in the chess crimes, Chester Fish. But <laughs> um, yeah, so whenever you find yourself doing a move like knight d8 or knight b7, you should say to yourself, oh, no, that's not what I wanted. You know, and so... The, the person who's really crying, too, when you play knight d8 is your rook on f8. And should you be winning this position? Oh, absolutely. And your instinct, I think, before you even play knight d8 should be, can I just win by pushing the pawns? No, I don't know, but I would rather try to do that than knight d8. And, of course, you write that knight a5 makes a lot of sense. And why? Because it helps in the struggle. It helps the, the shepherding of the pawns with like uh, knight b3 at some point. Or just being just being around the general vicinity is going to help that too. Okay. So, um, let's look at this knight d8. Weird things are going to happen. Yeah, and weird stuff happens. And in general, when you go passive, that's when you're going to lose your beautiful, beautiful pawns. We'll close it out here. And um, that was a really interesting stuff. I thought Scott played his best chess here where we end up getting this position, which black probably shouldn't allow, and then all of a sudden, it's a little bit... I mean, white has chances. It should be a draw, but white has suddenly chances. And I spent some time on this. Uh, and, you know, the move to really mess with black here would be h5. You know? <laughs> really, if I was black, I would not want to see h5 here. Uh, I guess I have to take it on h5, and then I got to worry about the king and pawn endgame. I got to worry about the pawn on f5, right? <clears throat> Maybe it's still holdable, but it's a nightmare. So then this stuff happens, and black is surprisingly, I want to emphasize surprisingly, black is holding on in this position. Oh! So, one of the things, you know, when I emphasize endgame play, it's generally because people go passive. And maybe a good way to understand it is this. People, chess players, are pretty good at understanding the intuitive need for development in the opening. Um, it's kind of an intuitive thing. Like, get your dudes out, let them roll. And, you know, when you think about the opening... You know, think about the game from the perspective of the opening. You can think of the pieces as a whole, and they need to work together, and everybody needs to play. And people lose sight of that basic intuition. Not people, but, you know, generally lower-rated players in positions in the end game. And they go passive, maybe for a pawn, or they don't know what to do, and then they make some move. And then it just... Chess also becomes a little ugly then when that happens. Um, so my just thing, I'll, you'll hear me, if you come on the show, you'll hear me say it again and again. It's passivity in the ending that really, really kills. And we're going to see a couple more examples of that coming in. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say lower rated people were <laughs> lower rated players on people. I said bonds aren't people. Okay, so here we go. 
Here's Mitch's game. This is a great game. This is really interesting. Uh, with hopefully some interesting lessons for Mitch. Uh, Mitch has been making great progress using the chessable and other things, and his opponent, uh, really strong FM. I think he's in it. I don't know. If he's not an FM, he's definitely FM strength, lives in St. Louis. I've hung out with the guy a little bit when I've done time there. Very strong, and I liked a lot of Julian's moves in this game. So this is, I think in terms of quality, this is the highest, yeah, it's probably the highest level game we got today. So let's check it out. Mistake. <laughs> mistake. And not objectively a mistake, but definitely a mistake for Mitch. So Mitch has been learning the chessable. And um, the thing about this bishop takes c6, Mitch, it is this is not a move for opening maestros. This is the move for somebody who doesn't want to learn too much theory and just wants to have some general ideas of what's going on. I know there's some course out there, I think recently on Chessable, that it's a, using this, um, and I'm sure they make you like memorize a gazillion lines. But I think, you know, A, you're missing out on a strength that you have when you play this way. And, um, I, a, B, I don't think it's the right move, best move anyway. Um, but I think if there's a virtue for you doing this, and maybe this was your intention when you did it, was to say something like, well, Cry thinks I should learn to play kind of end games, and so here we go. All right, so let's go a couple moves, and I'll say some more. Boom, 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 boom. Beautiful. Okay, there are several different ways for black to play that position. Uh, I like the way Julian played this one. <clears throat> and let's say a couple obvious things. Black has the two bishops. And when white took on c6, uh, dc was a free developing move. Uh, the pawn on f6 dominates the knight on f3. And um, I really hope that we'll soon get some people submitting games where there's that kind of just very basic annotation. Just telling me and yourself the basics of what you see happening. Um, and I think it really would have helped Mitch here to play some of the coming positions. Because there's this is not something that you can just like memorize uh, a gazillion lines. It's not, I don't think it's going to help too much. And the um, general uh, thing that I would say here is that white has to stir up some drama. Uh, and if he doesn't, black is going to slowly take over. Why? Because bishops control more squares than knights, and those dirty little uh, double C points, as we'll see in the game, can control a lot of central squares, and by doing so, control white's knights. And so what I'm trying to say is white needs to feel a sense of urgency here. He sacri white has literally sacrificed something here and needs to do something before it goes away. So let's check it out. Boom. I really like the way Julian played. Uh, some of this is debatable, but it didn't strike me as wrong. But here, definitely, I wanted to scream, Mitch. <laughs> I wanted to scream on this one. And you um, correctly say that you should have done something like knight d4. But let's use this as an example for, first of all, the need to talk about the dynamic, right? The need to say, oh, no, I have to do something pronto. And... I love this coming position for black. And even after knight d4, it's like a really, even if the computer says it's maybe a little bit better for white, it's still fascinating. And the long-term trend really is on black's side. Why? Because, you know, he has got also something to say. That king is an extra piece. 
uh, right now. Well, there's all kinds of complications, and he's got an extra piece. So it's not just the bishop. It's the fact that the king is extra. Now, could he become a victim? Well, that's your hope. But if he doesn't, <laughs> if that king doesn't become a victim, then, oh, man, and we're about to see it. Check it out. Boom, and then it's like, oh, man. Very simple and strong move. We're taking away the squares from the pieces. Uh, and we're going to use that extra pawn to control squares. C4, I'm not thrilled about it. But I, I'm also at a point here where it's hard for me to give advice. I don't, I don't know what you should do anymore. It's like it happened that fast. So I don't, I'm not thrilled. Why? Because he wants to play b5 at some point. And it's going to be hard for you not to take, right? So c4. Now, there are f just a few moves here that I didn't like that Julian played. And I, I didn't understand b6. I thought it was just so natural for him to play bishop e6 immediately. And then his position is just so nice. You know, this knight doesn't know what it's doing. This knight is pff, dominated. This guy's stuck. Poor Rook is like, dude, why are you in my face? You know, we got all this thing happening. Plus, like Black soon gonna, he just has an extra piece with the king. So I thought Bishop B6 is like, I don't know if it's winning, but I, oh man, I'd love to be. That's like, that's like Cry's dream position right there. Okay, so B6, Knight B1, hard to give advice. And then, boom. Obviously, black gave you a whole tempo, Mitch, and you're still in trouble. Boom. Oh, do I like that move? No. No, Mitch. I don't like that move at all, buddy. And so what I want you to write about is, like, at least the variation of, like, trying to hold on to the C4 point, whether it's rook C1 or knight FD2 or something else nasty. But I definitely don't want to see you taking that thing. No, no, no. You're going to free the rook? Oh, see, the bishops are starting to look real, my friend. <laughs> They're starting to look real. <laughs> now I think you're probably, you're getting close to toss, toast. I was going to say tossed. And that's, that might be appropriate too, but that's not how I want to talk. <laughs> not on Kostya's kid-friendly show, right? Okay, here we go. Boom. Good move. King f7, simple and strong. And the rooks, are they doing anything? No. I think this intuition for me goes back to a lot of the old Fisher games where in the King's Indian and other places, people would be trying to do demonstrations on the D file and it'd be like, what? What are you doing, son? <laughs> no one knows what you're doing. Okay. Now, in the meantime, what could you have done? You, you probably, Mitch, should be putting your stuff on more prophylactic positions. In particular, I would like to see a rook on c2. There's going to be various positions actually coming up where I want you to be the rook on c2 because we need to at least try to slow the dude down, and we need to, at some point, get our, our bro in obvious point to make, and I don't know if Julian really felt this enough, is this knight needs to come in. So we're going to have to watch him. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's an instructive... Actually, you wrote it. You'd rather be on the C file. I want the other rook, too, on the C file. One thing, actually, is I'm curious about uh, bishops, uh, two bishop positions like this, I think applies here. White, of course, wants to play the king over. But notice, is there really a square that the king is going to be happy on <laughs> over there? Not e, but e2 and e1, they're both pretty janky, right? Because at some point, it's, you know, fists of fury are going to fly. Boom. I think b4 was interesting. And I here wanted you to play rook c2 again. Um, the move that he, he can start thinking about b4 and rook takes a4 immediately. But let's just go, because we're going to see examples of this in just a second. h3, you write a worthless move. I want you to play rook c2, Mitch. Rook a, 
And what you did is you kind of banked your hopes on uh, always meeting b4 with knight a4. And rook a3, I'm certain black is still winning. I thought the simple way for black to do, do this at this point would have been boom, boom, boom. And I just do not see you surviving this. I think it's, it's all the way gone. You know, all, it's all the way gone. It's, you know, yeah, all the way gone. Okay, but I still like what he did. And he plays c4. Could he have sacked here? Now it's a little bit more complicated because the c, c pawn's hanging. Knight d4, c3, rook c2. Now, I've talked smack about how I wanted you on c2 forever, but I gotta say I'm not thrilled <laughs> with that, that particular c2 rook. Let's put him at least on e2. Have some pride. Have some pride, Mitch. Good move. I'm sure he's got other moves, but I like that one. And now uh, for the next bit of the game, Julian uh, lets his foot off the gas. And this happens to everybody. Maybe there's a mild time pressure, but you know, you think you're winning. And basically his minor crime that he does here is that he neglects to say to himself, uh, let's bring the knight in. There's very, going to be a couple points here. So I like that. And um, this was okay. And you write yourself, 95 was better. And let's just say the simple thing is that you're getting, you're getting wasted, man, with those bishops. <laughs> okay. Bishop d3, and you write rook e d1. And now look, uh, the thing that a lot of those rook moves I didn't like is it, it didn't feel like you felt the urgency to be like, I need to start some, I need to start some business, man. And so in the end game, you've got to always be looking for some little rook ed1 thing. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess, I'm going to try to crawl inside your mind for a second, that you were afraid of that. And at this moment, I don't know still what's happening, but at the very least, we're going to think about doing that and survival. Definitely. Get, give me that bishop. So, bishop d3. C2. E5. And here, dude blunders and plays uh, knight takes. And, uh, yeah. And you, you seize the day, buddy. You seize the day. And, um, now he goes for it. And now, Mitch, here's an interesting thing. Um, I am always talking smack about how people should analyze their games, right? And one thing I want to stress is that one great feature of analyzing your games is there's an emotional intelligence that you can gain. And... A lot of that, sometimes it's a very simple kind of intelligence. For example, here, what I think you can appreciate is you were just so happy to survive that you were like, bro, give me a draw, man. He's a higher rated player and yada, yada. But let's put himself in his shoes for a second. As someone who's been the higher rated player, who's blown the nice position, oh my God, I've done it enough times. You know, I will tell you this, you get frustrated and then you play some move like B3 because you're like, oh, I'm so angry with myself. And now I'm like on full tilt. Now, good move. And now, he's, he, now he better do something. Okay, knight B2. And now you agree to a draw. No way, Mitch. No, buddy. There is no draw here, my friend. There is no draw. Uh, let me express that your chances of winning this are great. And there's zero chance of losing. Let me say it in a really husky tone of voice. Zero chance of losing. And the thing you should see is that 
Even if it were rooks on the board, of course you should play on. Of course, there's no question. But especially now, because the bishop's advantage has vanished. Why? Because we're just playing on half the board now. All those other fancy things that it's doing as a long-range piece mean nothing. So that if you can create just one little nibble, some little weakness of his pawns, oh man, the knight and the rook are a dance. They are a real dance. And so, you know, maybe even playing this out as a training game or something would be interesting for you just to see your chances. You know, and you can go so slow here, knight d3, then play g3, and then just wiggle up the board, doing great. And I want to stress, I've done, I've done this thing too. You know, everyone's done it. But one, again, I want to say it again. The reason to study your own games is that by doing so, you are preparing yourself for the moment where this happens again. You're playing some higher rated person. You just escaped. You're so happy. And then you got to say, hey, buddy, we're, we're changing gears now. And now it's going to be love you long time. It's going to be love you long time in this position, right? Very emotional thing to, to learn. Okay. So let's go on. And this is, oh, this is a great game. So this is... I don't know who even to put in the limelight here, but this is Why Must I Lose to This Idiot, also known as Matt Fletcher and Shavam Nimzo, also known as Shavam. Both, uh, let's call them chess influencers in the Twitter sphere. Mm. And this is a great, uh, a great battle with some instructive moments. Here we go. All right, so kind of known variation. And queen c7, I can, I'm going to call that the old move. Maybe it's a new move. But I remember playing against this kind of thing in 1988 because this is what I played then as white. Rook c1, and now black plays an interesting move, e6. And I'm just going to guess that the main move is b6. Okay, so um, this is a very dangerous position for black. I think e6 has interesting points about it. Uh, ostensibly, you are preventing d5 or making d5 a little bit less juicy. But one of the problems for white in general is d5 is often not as cool as it looks because it ends up giving... Uh, black some squares for his pieces. And that's maybe a good point for me to just emphasize a Nimzovich rule, which will come into play later in this game too, which is that if you've got two bros hanging out, sometimes they're hanging out on f4 and e4, sometimes they're hanging out on e4 and d4. In general, you don't want to move the dudes because look at their beautiful control at the moment, right? Beautiful control. And moving either one of those pawns will give black squares. Okay, lecture over. In any case, I like e6, and I think a hidden virtue of e6 is that it will allow for what I consider Botvinnik's plan. Maybe Botvinnik didn't come up with it, but Botvinnik came up with an idea to play f5 at certain points. And it feels ridiculous, <laughs> ridiculous the first time you see it. But it's an idea to actually tickle this pawn into moving and also give the queen lateral uh, protection to the king. And you see it in a lot of uh, Grunfeld games nowadays. Okay, so queen d2 correct, b6. And now here again, this is where I think it would be useful to talk about what are the plans. You know, write it out. Um, say what you think the problem pieces are, what needs to be fixed, what's going on. So I'll put it in my own words. A very scary thing for black is that this um, uh, pawn majority 
in the sense, or can often turn into an attack. And that often black will play knight a5. And a lot of times it's just obliged to play knight a5 because the bishop is looking at the king. Um, the bishop, though, it's a funny piece because when it goes there, it's usually hitting a rock and no one knows what it's doing over there. In any case, it's scary to put knight a5 because it's on the side of the board. Um, now, white has a development advantage and I think needs to be focused on one thing, and that is killing this king. If you give black enough time, they will start using their queenside majority and kind of not too dissimilar from the, what we saw in Vishnu's game, Black needs to uh, use the c4 square as a post, you know, put a piece there. <clears throat> okay, so to that end, I wanted more discussion about rook fd1. It is not at all clear to me that that's the right move. Um, the only point to me to play rook fd1 is A, if you wanted to push the pawn, which I don't think you do, and B, defending the pawn, which, at least at the moment, not clear you need to do it. <clears throat> so, um, I feel pretty strong in saying that the right move is bishop h6. Why? Because that bishop needs to go. That is black's best piece, and it's his best defender of the king, and we got to get rid of it before we kill, before we kill it, right? before we kill him. Now, black could do all kinds of things, and maybe even it might even go something like that. I don't know. But in any case, one of the nice things about bishop h6 for us <clears throat> is on a very practical level, he's going to tell us. He's going to tell us what's going on. And uh, we need some information before we start putting our pieces places, like rook fd1. I don't know, might go to e1, might go to play f4 later. We might not move it at all, right? So I think rook fd1 is a, almost a full loss of a tempo here. And I think when you write it out as a, uh, you know, write out what the, you think the dynamic is, then, then, you know, I think you'll see that. So bishop b7, and then you really liked h4. The modern way, <laughs> the modern way. There are a lot of H4s that are modern, uh, but I think even back in the day, people would very much consider H4 to be played. Now, I want to stress, I like Bishop H6 a lot more. A lot more. Um, why? Because I want Black to tell me. I want me, him to tell me, and it's the one thing that I know, I know that I have to do. And again, maybe Knight A5, you know, bishop d3, f5, something like that. And a problem actually for him, and I should have mentioned this on the last night, a5, is if I play bishop d3 and he gets f5 in, at least now he gets to take back with the queen. Whereas if um, now I can play this and, you know, on knight c4, I, I, you really can't do that because of that move. So you'd have to take with the king, and then your king's a little bit misplaced. I want to play bishop h6. That's what I'm trying to say. And one thing that's interesting now is I think for Shavam is it's a great instructive position, this one is, for how to attack. And let's say the obvious. When there's attack, essentially it's an attack on both sides because black will do his business um, if we give him enough time then um, we uh, every tempo is going to count, right? Okay, so black plays h5, and it's definitely a little controversial. And Shavam writes, he could have, black could have played rook fd8 to avoid the exchange. Now, this is kind of what I mean by information, I'm not sure black wants to play bishop h8. It's also very dangerous to put it there as well. Um, like, for example, just knight f4 here kind of scares me. In any case, 
Um, Rook FD8 is a thought. And um, H5 is, of course, a weakness. And when you th one way to think about it is to say, well, when white plays h5, you know, maybe h6 at some point, but really I'm going to try to weaken the light squares, play hg. And then only one, maybe it'll be easier for me to like nibble down there. Well, now there's some real nibbles on g6, right? So I didn't like h5. And um, let me just mention a couple of plans. I think black should be looking at stuff like knight a5, bishop d3, and then, of course, I've mentioned f5. Definitely an interesting move for black here. And um, also, I think instructive, yeah, for sure instructive, is this nice move b5. Um, even if bishop b5, bishop b4 weren't available, it's still a useful sacrifice because if he takes it, you know, I get some squares and stuff. But here I am going to get some squares, and I am going to land the knight on c4, and it's going to disrupt white's business, you know? And this is exactly the kind of thing that black is looking for. Um, yeah, little, little problems. Counterplay. So h5. Finally, we get bishop h6. g4 is mentioned, and let me just say... Uh, interesting, but in general, you need to get rid of black's best defender. It's got to go. There's so we can talk about g4 and yada yada, but nothing's going to work until you get rid of the bishop. It's it's that thing's got to go. All right, rook a d8. Um, rook a d8. It's it's a funky move because. One of the weird things about rook c1, for example, is white in general doesn't want to trade rooks, right? And um, the rook on coming to the c file eventually and trading the rooks is a typical way for black to kind of like get out of dodge, and he needs to fight for the c file. So I wasn't really thrilled with this, and I think black has basically been avoiding playing knight a5, and white re re rewards the, the lack of knight a5 in just a second. So queen e3, what is that? It's a clear loss of tempo. So let's look at what Matt writes. Bishop g7 looks logical to me. Queen g5, there might be better moves, but I like it. We're threatening knight g3 and knight f4 with a huge attack. Queen e7, snip, snip, f3, and he writes, with, with, which is an interesting equalish ending. Let me disagree. No, this is far from equal. White is, well, I don't know how much better, but he is much better. The knight is dominated. The bishop still has his annoying diagonal. Uh, this guy's blunted. And our friend, the king, is just going to walk right up and plant himself there. And white's got a nice position. So I definitely wouldn't call this equal. Um, <clears throat> Shivam, your soul should tremor and say, look, oh no, that's a loss of tempo. <laughs> that's a loss of tempo. Oh no. Queen e7. Interesting. Interesting. Now, um... Matt gives this an exclam, and um, I mean, it's definitely giving some question marks to the pawn. But the move is made beautiful after White's next move here, and he plays e5. Um, so uh, I think bishop g5 is given in the notes. That makes sense to me. But also... Probably you could play even bishop g7, king g7, and some kind of either, you could either go queen g5 or out to that end game, or if you wanted, you could play pop, pop, queen g3, and now you're threatening the knight f4s of the world. So I think both of those look pleasant for white. 
Queen G3 looks very nice. Um, and actually, I think you wrote that, yeah. This, but this is just nice. Look at that. You, and and maybe d5, but you know, before he plays d5, he should be looking juicily at that square. Okay. Another equalish ending, and this is a thing. No, <laughs> I really don't think this is equal. This is not equal. Okay. And in any case, e5 is played. Mistake. Mistake. And um, why? Because you wouldn't want to do it unless you're really delivering the goods. In general, maybe it's a good way to state the rule is don't play e5 until you're delivering the goods. And clearly you have a threat of bishop g5 and maybe dreams of playing to knight e4, but none of those are going to happen. And instead you're giving loads of nice squares to Matt's pieces, which he says, thank you. And now knight e is coming. And now I very much believe in black. And one thing I want to stress here is that it's a big deal. And this is something to write out in the annotations. It's a big deal that black got his queen uh, Onto the defense. The queen is the best defender, and there she is. So just in terms of force count here, especially with knight e7 coming, I believe in black. Now, Matt writes, exclaim, knight of four. This is a good attempt to play for a win. Um, and I think bishop e6, you guys were writing that it wasn't any better than a draw. And I want to say, I'm not sure uh, that this is going to be a draw for white. Um, I was looking at, just intuitively, I was like, well, 97. And, you know, we gave you a pawn, but we got a nice tempo too. And I think we're, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly what's happening, but I definitely think I'd rather be black. Mm-hmm. I would rather be black here. We just have all the activity. And this is the great thing about the Grunfeld. You can start really dancing on some heads over here in this opening. Okay. So instead, knight f4, thematic, knight e7. Again, I'll state this thing about the force count. It's a simple and beautiful idea just stating that in general, in these weird positions, if you have more force on the attack and you can count it out in a very dogmatic way, then you're probably going to win or survive depending on the case. Okay, so knight e7, you talk about queen g4, but okay, bishop d3. And I wasn't thrilled with bishop d3 um, because honestly, your bishop is doing great things over there anyway. Still... Of course, it's not the easiest thing to decide what to do. And you guys, of course, are getting into some time pressure. Don't play G3. <laughs> Don't play G3, whatever you do. Um, maybe, you know, and honestly, maybe you just got to do it. But so, for example, I was wondering about 96. Do I know for sure? I don't know for sure. But that would be my question mark. You know, and then obviously there's weird stuff going on, like knight f5, queen g5. I don't know. It's too complicated. It's it's very complicated, and I'm not sure. Well, I don't know. I don't understand. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, yeah, I have no idea. I have no idea what's going on. It just might, maybe it's possible to survive. Yeah, there might be some vague possibility of surviving here. Okay, so bishop d3 and now queen g4. And both sides pointed out that cd looks like it's winning. And definitely, it looks like you're just, you've got it all. And my guess is that this knight g6 thing seems so imposing that you know, it, it didn't seem possible for you guys, for you to do anything. And yeah, it's a real disaster for him to take because he 
I mean, think about it. It's like this one rook that isn't working gets to work. And then we got ourselves some real problems. Yeah. And honestly, even without the rook f2, I'm kind of still not thinking that white's going to survive that. So queen g4 and bishop e2. And now uh, knight f5. Basic tactical mistake. Um, and queen f5 was also mentioned as maybe just a draw. But let me just say, if you want to win, you know, just go queen h4. And you're still winning. <laughs> you're, still, you're still winning. And, and what I mean by that is, like, you should trust yourself in this position that you're still winning. Because the fact that your queen is so close to the king well, suggests that you should have chances to win this thing. Okay. So, by the way, it's kind of interesting, right? We haven't talked too many tactics here. But it's only in this position that the tactics really raise their heads. And so here we're going to get knight f5. Boom. And then the game has gone downhill dramatically for Matt. The game is lost, and then the uh, just general rules that we're going to gather from this are going to be that white played pawn snatcher here and forgot that black could play too. Why is this winning? It's not just the exchange. It's the fact that our rooks are so beautiful and they have open files. Yes, rook c7 is much better. And now we got a little drama. And that's the pawn clutcher. <laughs> that's the pawn clutcher right there. And then all of a sudden, things get a little hokey. They get a little hokey now, my friends. And then all of a sudden, we got to start asking who's better and why. And I think, you know, since this has happened to everybody, let's just put it in words. White was an old time pressure and said something like, well, I got him. He blundered, and now it's all over, so I'll just go take the pawns. The pawns, he only needed one of them, but he got both, and now the rook is discoordinated, and now it's like nightmare. It's a real nightmare, and in time pressure, you're probably going to lose. I mean, I don't know. It looks terrible. Check to the miserable king, and then I don't know. I don't know what happened, and it's all over. So really exciting game. Uh, I thought a lot of those positions really um, important stuff to understand about the attack. Um, not all of us are attackers. I'm definitely not an attacker. But uh, it is something, a skill, if you will, that you can learn. Okay. Here we go. Door. We're moving on to Door's game. And I think we got to go over here with scene two. And right, we're moving on to the maneuvering section. I was enjoying those games too much, and now I'm a little bit behind on the clock. I'm a little bit behind on the clock. It's all right. All right. So here we go. With door. This is, this is actually an over-the-board game. And I think Israel's now in lockdown. But um, this was played in real life. So, this is a very old-time opening. And again, I think it would have been really useful to write about what's going on, especially after a move like h6, you know. And in general, what's weird about the Four Knights is that in other, let's call them, Rui systems, or even systems with bishop c4, you can play c3 to dominate the knight, and give the bishop some maneuverability to not get taken. And so you lose that, and then you end up playing something weird like a3. As you know, I am not a friend of giving away Tempe. I wasn't a friend of h6 either. So you know already. 
They want you to play something like castles. All right, a3, h3. I don't think you need it. Um, and I think um, a move, the, the move that appeals to me here, actually, even right now, is to say that move h6 is sus, suspect, as the millennials say. And I would want, you know, to, to speed things up. And I like bishop e3. Because I'm looking at maybe some light square weaknesses, maybe this square someday. And I'm not thrilled with this thing. And bishop e3, I feel like, yeah, white's got, I feel like white's a little bit better. And I, if he wants to take, I'm happy with it, you know. All right. So a3. Some of these moves, Dora, you're going to see they're too sophisticated. You know, you, you're like outdoing yourself. D6, H3, Bishop E6. Now this weird move, Knight D5. You know, I think you should consider, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't like that one. No, I don't like it. Let's consider this for a second. You said that this was a necessity. And what I want you to see about this is you're concerned, I get it, about losing the pawn on d5. But honestly, he's going to have to worry a little bit about it, that pawn taking business. Anyways, bishop d5 was sad. Um, was I down with knight d4? Not 100%. I thought he would be better just playing knight e7. And then, you know, swing the knight over, he's much better. So I didn't get that move. I definitely didn't get that move, Dor. You're killing yourself with your own fanciness. <laughs> yeah, just play c3 and it's, I don't know, roughly equal or something. Maybe, you know, you, yeah. So this is like some fancy business you're doing to yourself. Again, I guess, okay, right, he has to be a little careful. So, boom. I then I, I was, I kind of wanted him to do something like g6 here, door. And then, because I want him to play, I want him to hurt you with f5. That's what you deserve. <laughs> That's what you deserve here, buddy. <laughs> All right, knight g6. I didn't like that one. If you want to cover your d7 square, if it's really that big of a deal, which I'm not sure it is, play rook a e8, and then you can meet queen d7 with rook e7. This is passive. Okay, actually, excuse me. Of course, it's your opponent that rook a d8. All right, so he, he did this. Probably shouldn't have. And now we're going to get our endgame phase where Dor is going to, for the most part, outplay his opponent. Thank you very much. Boom. Good move. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. I recommend looking at the game. Uh, Smyslav Oiva, groaning in 1946 candidates tournament. Where Smyslav won a very nice end game, which has some similarities with this one. Um... Your opponent, though though in that position, Oiva's position was worse than Black's here, your opponent, I feel, must immediately play knight e7. Uh, he makes several mistakes now coming up. Not great. Splitting his pawns, fixing your double pawns. I like that move. I like that move. I like that move. I like that move. I do not like that move. <laughs> I do not like that move. You will eventually play b5, Dor. So why are we playing a5? It's like you're dreaming of some monster b5, which actually, amazingly, your opponent gives you for reasons that I do not understand. Um, but right, 
A5 no bueno. So many other good moves. Uh, you could consider King F3 the, or the more simple Rook AB2. Hark. Hark. <laughs> Hark, as they say, maybe even B5 immediately. Horrendo move. One of the worst. One of the worst. Chess crime. People want to talk about chess crime. At least it wasn't you, Dor. That's a true chess crime. Now, I want you to write it, though. When, I, when you, know, you do the submission, say, D5, that, at the very least, your eyebrows got to raise and be like, what? <laughs> what are you doing, buddy? <laughs> say hello to my little friends over here. Okay. And now, I think you are, well, probably winning. D4. Knight D1. Uh, I was freaked out by knight d1. Um, I guess it's okay. I don't know. I shouldn't be freaked out by knight d1. I'm not going to. I refuse to be freaked out. So, king d6. Now, knight f2. Um, I would want at least some variations here about b takes a6. I think your assumption is that you are not winning that thing. Like, boom, 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 boom. But it looks pretty scary to me. <laughs> yeah, that looks pretty scary to me, my friend. Do, am I 100% sure? Not entirely, but I, I'd be really scared as black. All right. Now, he did this to himself, and it's true. The suffering is very much on, still happening with knight f2 but in in the purpose of the analysis a great uh position to look at you know to um investigate and you that's how you learn endings is by going through variations like that okay and what is the main point can white black is going to have to spend a thousand tempi dealing with those pawns how long can we keep them? And then can white create some kind of drama over on the king side to bust in with this king? That's going to be the question for the analysis. Okay. So knight f2, f5, and you are correct. BA now wins very easily. King f3. Boom. Now I always want to say... <laughs> In general, he doesn't want to do this. It's very similar to cross crime. Now, we understand he's afraid of BA, but, you know, play, can he, couldn't he do like King C7 instead if he's afraid of that? Now, is it truly in trouble after King C7? Yes, but there's some hope. So, um, AB, we should also say that's suspicious looking. And while we're at it, he should be thinking of a move like knight c6, right? I think that's a move he should be thinking about. Um, and that's one of the reasons I was like, knight of two, I'm not 100%. Yeah, I'm not 100% on that move. Okay. So here we go. Uh, knight of two didn't look right. King f3, boom, boom. B6, and now you panicked. Mm. Panic move. I saw that rook a1 works tactically because rook a1, if he takes the thing, you can go back, right? Rook back to b1, you're pinned. Um, I saw knight c3 and decided that the two pawns will be compensation enough for the exchange. Okay. It's weird because, if you, especially if you saw it, like the rook, rooks belong behind past pawns. Mm-hmm. Now the game is getting crazy. Well, you said it right. The madness has truly begun. <laughs> and it's your fault. <laughs> it's your fault. It's not his fault. It's your fault. 
Do we know what's happening? I don't know what's happening, Dor. No, I don't have a clue, buddy. So uh, I'm sure it's dr drastic time pressure here. Rook c1, b8, rook f1, very nice. Uh, I, and when I first looked at this, I thought I found an easier way. You wrote about knight c5. That's that's a little harder to see. Let's what you did. Let's just see here. Boom. I'm gonna say you're winning this thing, bro, and you just needed to think about it a little bit here. And this is right. This is the time in the very in the variations. You're winning this thing, and you just need to yeah write some variations out because this is winning. This is winning. Uh, uh, I'm going to assume, I don't know if I should assume too much. I don't want to assume too much. But yeah, rook c5, I don't know. What, why? I, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. All right, knight c1. And a7. Boom. And you do b8. But if you played, and again, I understand you're in time pressure, but for the notes you want to be thinking about a move like rook c5 here. And it's very hard to imagine he's going to survive after rook c5, right? They say two pawns on the sixth are better than a rook. Well, <laughs> two pawns on the eighth. Holy moly. That's some, that's some people. All right. So here we go. Juan's coming up, and Juan is playing. We got two games playing the end game repertoire. If you want to check it out, uh, we got it on our YouTube channel. And C4 is just inaccurate, I guess, against D6. Boom, very nice move. And White falls for a positional trap that I discuss in that video. Namely, he puts his knights in what seems like the natural position of c3 and f3. But now they're just beautifully cut, dominated by everything. And white is, I'm going to go ahead and say positionally toast. He's positionally gone in this position. Now, doesn't mean it's going to be completely easy to convert, but it's certainly a done deal. So bishop e3, king c7, good move. Bishop c5. Now, this is certainly a good-looking move. Rook fc1. But the coming moves, there's some, uh, there's some insouciance, okay? And what I mean by that is you're just not aware of some of the problems that are ahead of you here. So, your bishop is beautiful, and so is his, and you're right. You want to trade off that dark square piece. In fact, that bishop on e3, it's his only good piece. But when we trade it off, his it's not like that structure... I mean, you're kind of helping his king and helping him control the square d4. So it's not the easy... It's not necessarily a win for you. Okay, now, the other thing about this, though, is there is a danger here, and white doesn't realize it either. It's that white should just be dreaming with all of his soul to play knight d5 check, right? And he misses it at least on one occasion. And so you need to be hyper aware of that knight d5 thing, and for example, I think a5 is a good move, but you got to say to yourself when you do it, you got to be like, right, if he goes knight d5, I just step back. You can go to a different square too, but I'm just saying, <laughs> now you tell the thing to go away, and then we'll talk, you know? But we definitely want to keep that knight under wraps. And that's the problem with playing knight e7, whether it's in this position or after bishop takes e3, as in the game. Boom 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 and he plays b4 and you say you should be playing a5 
And the thing is, A5 is good, just not for the reasons that you're saying. Right? You want to prevent B4. And it's true, B4, at least he should be trying to do something over there. He, but his pieces are still so terrible, it's not going to work out that great, right? The real issue is, in this position, dude could have played knight d5. Now, do I think you're still better after, let's say, boom, boom, boom? Uh, probably, but we got to say, hey, hallelujah, he fixed his knight. <laughs> he fixed his knight. And then for sure, yeah, some kind of move like c5, and he's not doing that bad anymore, you know? Okay. So one thing about, I'm sure is knight d5, both players probably weren't thinking about it, but it's the example of a tactic that you should see, both players should see just through a hyper-awareness of, oh my God, that knight has to move. It's so terrible. Okay. Diana, thank you for rating us. All right. B4, rook a d8. And you write, and here I felt cramped. White has an easy plan, pawn storming and opening my king. And notice, it's interesting, right? The pawns on e3 and e4 are kind of nice in a lot of ways. They at least keep your junk out of d4. I didn't like rook a d8. I thought a5 was probably stronger. But what should he play? He should play knight d5. All right, now, the, now it's over. The, that drama's over. And he misses this move. Very nice. And now we start mopping it up. Should he play knight d5? Probably. And you do, um, you do a little bit of a mitch here with rook d7. And what I mean by that is you say to yourself, hey, um, if I double, I'll be glorious over there. Uh, but it's, you know, the knight on f3 has one job, right? It's to keep you out of d2. Otherwise, that knight is just so terrible. No one knows what it's doing. So you write bishop c4 looked good. Knight c4 looks good to me. Knight c4 looks great. So rook d7. Again, uh, you want to be thinking about knight c4. And let's just write that it is true now that there's some interesting drama because because this thing is happening. Now, let's just look for a second, because I really didn't like knight c8. It's obviously not the kind of beauty that we were hoping for when we did this. And you wrote h3. <clears throat> I get it. This was not the drama you wanted. Um, has, has it gone bad? Maybe it has. The question is, how bad is it? How soul-crushing is it for us to play knight a8? It's kind of soul-crushing. I wasn't thrilled about I wasn't convinced by b5, really. Why? Because I wanted him to fix his junk. And look at that. He's fixing your knight here. Um... Some weird things happen here. Good. I don't know what it is with Lee chess studies. Maybe someone can tell me, but it always says normal. Normal zero one. I'm like, what? What, what does that mean, normal? <laughs> is there something normal that happened? <laughs> Maybe it means normal analysis or something. I don't know. Hmm. Oh. So I got I got two Mitches in here. We don't want two Mitches. We already did Mitch. All right, here we go. This is Yaye. Maybe I'm saying that wrong. So here we go. And I'm going to label this. Let's go back and look at my labels for a second because everybody needs label. Yaye loses the tension. And so uh, it's important important thing that, you know, needs to be talked about at least once in a while, that there are going to be several positions where you need to hold the tension. And I thought this game was instructive in that 
there were three examples where Yahya lost the tension, gave up the tension. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in the examples. All right, so here we go. I don't like c3. In general, I think if you're going to play this for white, uh, when they play d6, that's your signal to play h3. And uh, knight h5 is good. Okay, so black is doing great. I would say black is a little bit better here. And this is our first example of losing the tension. So what, do I, what is it, what are we talking about? When you take, what you're doing is you're worried like the bishop's going to go somewhere. I get it. It's a very psychological thing. But when you look at it closer, you're like, wait a second, that bishop, he's not going anywhere. That bishop's going absolutely nowhere. And um, instead, when we say holding the tension, we're talking about uh, holding the tension, keeping it hanging over his head, and we'll take when we're ready. And so right now, for example, there's a variety of ways that you can play this position. And let's say the obvious dynamic. Again, it's good to write it out. Your bishop on g7 is amazing, not only because it's a bishop, but because as the unopposed bishop, even though your king looks kind of weakened, it's going to be next to impossible for white to crack you on the king in front on the king because your bishop's so amazing. <laughs> All right, yeah. So um, and right, Vishnu writes in the chat. He's like, maybe what black is worried about white is worried about knight g five. I'm sure he is. I'm sure he is. I don't doubt it. But we can see on every move, we, of course, we calculate it. And here it's easy to see that knight g5 isn't available because of the intermezzo, knight takes g3. Okay, now here's the thing that's a practical problem. Black's going to have this nice position, but how should he set up his pieces? It's not an easy thing, and I'm sure there's more than one answer. Um, so the moves that appeal to me, just looking at it, are c5, knight c6, uh, maybe e5, f5. Those are the ones that appeal to me. And every situation is a little bit different. Like a lot of times you see these positions and the pawn isn't on c3 or the bishop's on d3, so you got to figure it out. But in general, don't take. All right, so example one of losing the tension. You're still doing great. c5, fine. Knight c6, fine. Even if it's true that you're dominated there, that the knight will have uses on c6. Queen c2. And now you write that f5 was forced to stop knight g5. And I want to say that no, I don't think it was forced. It's not necessarily a bad move. Notice, too, that if you are going to do it, it would have been better with the bishop on g3, at the very least giving him a heart attack about whether we're going to play f4. And f5, the purpose really is, and this comes about a little bit in the game, to crack him on the dark squares. Um, let me just mention, just because it's useful to see, is that rook e8, I'm not saying this is the best move, but in a lot of London positions or positions with bishop g7, this is a useful defense. It's also just kind of instructive. You're not getting mated. You're just not getting mated. No way, Jose. Right? That's a great example of the bishop. If he had a dark square bishop, you'd be mated, but now you're not going to be mated. All right, so f5. Check, not a great move. Thank you very much. Do you want to put your pawns in the opposite color of your beast? Yes, you do. Queen d6, good move. And now you take. All right, good. So... Example number two of losing the tension. Um, your position is, I mean, he's given you so much in the last two moves. Um, and your position is still going to be great after C takes. But it's definitely a case where you are afraid of some kind of DC business. And you should tell yourself, you should say, hey, wait a second. 
He's not going to do anything over there. If he takes, he's just opening my bishop. And whose king is, who is the king is going to be the hunted? The king on c1 is going to be the hunted. It's time to hunt that dude. So uh, a more natural move would be to keep the tension, play bishop d7, put the rook on c8, and just ask him what he wants. Just ask him what he wants. Okay. Boom. Boom. Not correct. We actually had this example earlier. I forget maybe whose game it was at this point. But here too, white has surrendered the center. And black, of course, should really think about e5. And you wrote that. Uh, I do not believe that black is or white is going to survive after e5. And let's state the obvious. And this is really important to write out in the notes. Opposite sides castling, tempi, and attack are going to be important, right? So uh, e e5 is good. By the way, bishop d7. Also a good move, you know. Taking here, really important to see that it blunts your bishop, you know. And where is your attack? Your attack, you know, you're going to do some, the, whether you're not, you, you don't have to play e5, you could play bishop d7 and rook c8 first. Also really great. You've got the center, you've got the bishops, and your king, honestly, I guess I think I like your king a little bit better. f4, don't like it. Um... And e5, I'm not thrilled with either. Now, your you have lost some of your advantage, but the simple plan for me here, I guess, would be bishop d7, put a rook on c8, ask him this question, start launching, and mate him. It's time to mate. <laughs> it's always time to mate. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I won't say it aloud, but I truly care about you guys. <laughs> and I wouldn't even call it a minority attack, Steve. Technically it is, but the idea of the minority attack is to get a pawn weakness. Our idea here is mate. You know, we're interested in mate. Okay, so f4, yeah, I don't like it. If the king were over on g1, I would think this was great. Boom, boom. Things are getting loose. And uh, F3, he could think about other moves, but we'll leave that to him. Bishop F5, Bishop D3. And now example number three of where you lose the tension by taking. Because the queen doesn't want to be on C2. So, I mean, what's the natural move? I think you actually wrote it, rook a c8. Now notice, you even give a variation here, and you were concerned about g3. Do I get it? I get it. Um, and oftentimes with the tension, the reason people get rid of the tension is so that they don't have to worry about whatever tactical ghost it is that they've got in their mind, like you're worried about g3. But when you take on d3, well, that's a huge uh, positional concession that now by touching the d4 square, uh, rook c8 is going to come with a lot less oomph, you know? And, you're, you know, he had, he had two pieces on the c file. Now he just has one. So now things have definitely started to slide, and e5 don't like it. Because, and, and again, try to write it out in words, the... Rook on d1 is getting more powerful now because we're talking to the d-pawn. And uh, the knight is going to get more powerful because it will be get the d4 square. So white doesn't have to be a genius to play this one. He goes, snip. And he says, give me that. And you said endgame? Mmm. Almost, if you're going to, you are going to give up the pawn at this point. So best not to go in the endgame. And now this is, well, do I want to say it's technically lost? Probably. However, you still have chances. And it's important to see that you need, you need violence now. <laughs> violence is now your friend. 
So, um... Mm, it's a little bit hard, but definitely not this. And you're right, C4 was weird. Uh, could he have taken it? I, I assumed so. You wrote about Rook E3. I, I don't know why he can't take the pawn. So, boom. He does some funny business. Um, and let's say the obvious here, if you, in this position, you got to play A4, buddy. You got to play A4 and you wrote about it. And then you can at least consider that. And you could consider both rook c5 there and b3. And there you have fine chances to draw. Fine chances. And now, I mean, he should be winning. But he's going to blow it in just a second. Now, here's an instructive mistake from him. It would have been nice to talk about why. A3. No. Oh, God, that's a bad one. <laughs> that's a really bad one. Ah! That's a real screamer. First of all, with B3, you know, maybe, uh, what is he doing? At some point in his chess career, the guy has been under a big attack on the queen side, and he didn't want his king to get opened, so he played A3 to close things down. In some positions, I'm sure that's the right move. But now with a3, he puts his king in a box lose it, and loses a clear tempo because that black doesn't want to play ba and you lose the opportunity to play ab yourself and then win that pawn. So he loses a lot of his uh, winning potential here. You said thank you very much. And here... You kind of freak out a little bit. Rook d6, knight c3, and then a crime happens. You played rook d4, and yeah, I don't like it. Um, I was thinking, why not rook d3, right? Rook d3. Honestly, at this point, I don't know who's playing for the win. You, you take that pawn in f3, you're gonna, your king's definitely better. The bishop's definitely a better piece. You get a pawn running on the king's side, and holy moly, there we go. Right? So maybe I'm missing something there, but rook d3 looks very strong. And here you exchange your best piece. And uh, it's all gone. Definitely all gone. Okay. I got to keep, I got I to gotta move it along. This is a different Julian. So let's check it out. Yeah, possible. Bishop b7, a little bit more normal. c5, normal. And hilariously, we have the same structure that we got in our Siobhan game, except the bishop is on e7 instead of on g7. Now, Let's say this is a good example of a superficial move. You are obsessed with playing queen d3 and mate, and I get it. I, I'm gonna just say, <laughs> I'll tell you guys a story. So, um, I sometimes, you know, a lot of people reach out to me for lessons, and I have a hard time saying no. And I'm teaching this old guy now, and you know, you could say, "Cry, what are you teaching this old guy for?" You know. And, you need to be teaching other people, buddy. Anyways, I hope, like, someday, you know, maybe I'll get bicycle lessons, if that would help me, from some famous person in my old dotage, and that would be cool. But in any case, I'm getting this guy lessons. And, you know, he's just starting out. Doesn't need me. In any case, he loves to do this thing where, like, every game he wants to play queen h5, knight g5, queen h7. <laughs> And I'm like, dude, dude, you got to, like, slow it down and think about the rest of your bros. And that's exactly what's going on in this position. And there's a variety of reasonable moves here for white. But in general, any plan that white comes up with needs to involve 
these pieces and thinking about what's happening. And for my business, what I see happening is that this night is dominated. Uh, you've got great central control. And that central control is going to put the squeeze on several of Black's pieces. Um, so, for example, you'd start asking yourself, say, well, is, can he do anything to me? You know? And the answer is not so much, at least not at the moment. After bishop c2, I think he can. In any case, uh, there's moves, knight g3 looks good. I really like a4. Just ask him the question, because he doesn't want to play a5. You know, just see what he wants after a4. And you're developing your rook at the same time. <laughs> should he consider now bishop a6? Yes, he should, because he has got less space. c5 is okay. Here we go. Let's go. We've got to call it superficial. Rook c8, a4. Now you do it. And now f5. The Bobvinic plan. Holy moly. <laughs> the um, thing, when, you, when your pieces get discombobulated like this, it is generally when a nasty tactic is going to happen. And I'm guessing maybe black has something more fancy, but snip, snop, snick, crock, and pop look good for black. Maybe something better, but I, that's just the first thing that came to my mind. And f5 is genuinely madness. <clears throat> now, we talked about f5 in the other position, but I don't think he's ready. <laughs> I don't think he's ready for this. Okay, let's see what happened. Pop, c4. And now he's lost all of his play on the queen side. All of your pieces are looking at the king's king side. And that's why when you do the notes, think about what's going on. Try to write it out. Rook FB1. No, I don't like it. What are you doing? You're trying to play on like his only couple squares? You want to take his only couple squares away? When you look at it, it's like, oh, man, well, you know, knight F4 looks good. Knight G3 looks good. Rook AE1 looks good. All that stuff looks good. Looks like you're murdering the guy. Bishop F4 looks good. It all looks good. So... You've got a beautiful center control. The knight's dominated. It's time to waste this dude. It's time to end him. Okay, FB1. I don't get it. Maybe I do. I don't know. No, I don't. Some business happens, and your, your opponent is a monster. I don't understand. If not for this move, I would be lost. I don't know. I, I'm just gonna say I'm not I'm not 100% on that. <laughs> not 100%. I think maybe you can take on g5, d5, snip. In any case, this is fine for you. Cd7, fe2, queen e2, queen d7, queen c4. And when you do your annotations, write it out and say you should say I'm winning here. Why? I'm up. It's not just I'm up pawn. My king's better, and with the opposite color bishops, I'm wasting this guy. We've said on the show a bunch of times, opposite color bishops, the reason you're wasting them is that now you can get an attack on the light squares that he will have no defense to. Didn't like it. Um, though I get it, I guess. Maybe I get it. I don't know if I get it. In any case, some passive stuff. Hmm. I don't get it. I like g4. That was a good move. And then you're going to win. As, or as Lee Chess says, normal. Okay. Good game, Julian. And let's move on to Austin's game. I think Austin is the first time on the show. And this was played in the Scottish Championships. Um, good stuff and um, yeah first of all we should mention Austin is dramatically out, outrated by his opponent so we got a battle of the giants here and um, 
I think he was absolutely right in taking on F3. And um, since I once made a similar mistake, let's dwell on it for a second. The, the, the light square bishop is bad. The bishop on the light square bishop of whites is blunted, and black's dark square bishop is beautiful. So this should be a dream position. And I later discovered there were games where some GMs took on F3 without even being provoked. Just like, get it out of there. It's gone. Okay. Snip. Knight D2. Interesting. It's obviously a little bit awkward. And you correctly write, I think this move is pointless. Now here's the challenge in this position. It's hard to know what to do because now you do not really want to do any pawn breaks. Why? Because your enemy is the bishop on f3, and if you do any kind of pawn breaks, the, the beast is going to get loosed. So that's why it's difficult to uh, do anything that can open, potentially open the bishop. One move that just sprang to my head that some people will certainly call weird is b5. Why? Uh, well, to give ourselves a little space and to um, force the c4 pawn to tell us what it wants, you know? And, right, then he's not going to crack us as well in the d5 square so easily. And if he takes... Our knight gets the c6 square. That's another nice bonus. So I like b5 a lot. And I want to say you are not the only one to feel consternation uh, with the move in this position. Be like, well, what am I supposed to do? And if you didn't want to get fancy with b5, then knight d7 could be your default move. But on knight d7, you are going to have to worry about e4. Okay. Great game today that I thought Fabi should have won in this structure with a more advantageous position for Fabi and then e4. Oh, Fabi, man. <laughs> he was killing Magnus, man. I was so happy. I was so happy when he got that position with e4. Okay. Boom. Snip. 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 Now, I'm not thrilled with inviting the bishop to e4. Knight d7, because now you have to go chase it away. Knight f6, bishop g2. Okay. And right, you write another tempo waster. Now, what is going on? You've, you feel at, at a loss about what to do, right? And so here is exactly when you annotate your games to try to express in words what is the dynamic and what you need to be looking for. So, for example, I would call this position the incinerator. And this was a term that Nimzovich created, and the idea is that we are restraining this d5 advance. And um, so a simple goal for black really should be to put pieces on the d-file now and to trade pieces. The more we trade pieces... And the longer that pawn sits there, the more the d4 pawn begins to look like an isolated pawn, which it essentially is. It doesn't have any friends to back him up. Um, in this position, by the way, there's a variety of openings. You can get Carl Kahn, you can get this, uh, Scandinavian. In fact, this thing with the exchanging the bishop, that's, I think, John Bartholomew's favorite trick. Carlson has used that too. You exchange it, you get this structure, you maneuver around a little bit, your opponent blunders, and then you win. Okay. So, h6. Yeah, what is super op? <laughs> what is super op, Kostya? I don't know what super op is. <laughs> Just general millennial slang. Okay. b4, and in principle, I like this move from white. Um, he could do a variety of things, but in general, he wants this bishop to achieve freedom. Now, let's just give a little background. From this moment, Austin is going to have a great idea, and 
it's going to involve sacking the exchange for that bishop. Now, writing it out, I think, would have helped him out, i.e. to say, Black's white's asset is the unopposed late square bishop. He's our enemy. So our, my intention is to get rid of the thing. Okay. So b4, interesting move. Were other moves possible? Absolutely. So black plays a5, and now some fun stuff begins to happen. Um, a5 in general, I'm going to say I don't like. Um, because the thing that white should say is, well, I'm happy to uh, trade anything that opens my business onto this pawn. Now, I think probably both players had a uh, prejudice in the sense that they probably said something like, hey, well, um, buddy, <laughs> buddy, um, you've, like, I've, you've broken up your pawns, but that's the least of his worries here because once b7 comes under attack, white can do things like a4 and just start hammering him, and it becomes very unpleasant. Notice that the knight on f6, that dude has no squares, no squares. And what white should realize when this goes down is he's going to lose the d5 square, very important. Bishop b7, and now he gets a shocker. Bam! Nice move, Austin. Very nice move. And this is what White gets for not understanding himself what was at stake. And is Black now better? Yes. He's got the better king. His knight is awesome. The light squares have suddenly lit up. Beautiful exchange sacrifice, Austin. And yes, this is like, maybe he was like, I'm playing some chump, I'm going to waste him. And I'll tell you, when a, a low-rated player plays some deep idea on you, like exchange sacrifice, your mind might be kind of lazy at the moment. Like maybe against a stronger opponent, you'd be kind of looking for it. And then you get slapped by it, and then you're like, oh, God. Okay. Queen a4, rook c8. And you wrote here that you thought you had a slight edge due to the past C pawn. Um, it's interesting. I, I, I would go further than that. It seems like to me you are just a mammoth position. Everything is going your way here. Very instructive. Um, and here you slipped up in what is maybe a kind of interesting way. You write correctly, you should play c3. But one thing I want you to note is when you play queen a6, the reason not to do it is just because your queen is so awesome where it is right now. And I feel like if you had felt her awesomeness, you would have said to yourself, all right, I have real attacking potential down there, some really nasty things can happen to my opponent's king. And so if you, you felt that, then I think you wouldn't play queen a6. And, it, and if you were not going to push the c pawn, then at least the first natural move to consider, I think, would be queen d5. So right here, the trend unfortunately goes downward. And right, I wanted you to play knight. You, you said it correctly, knight d5, and mostly because that's just an ugly move. And um, nice move. And here you blow it. I guess it's for the last time here. Um, and play knight c5 instead of... Um, What did we need you to do? C3 here or something, right? Yeah, last chance to play C3. You wrote it yourself, and, and now we're just done. It's all gone. By the way, in this position, one of the dogmas that I preach on the show is do not. <laughs> if you've got, um, if you are down the exchange, whatever you do, do not trade rooks. Because your rook and bishop are doing separate things, and then, you know, in particular, covering the light squares. And once you trade the thing, that poor bishop, no bueno. So, rook somewhere else. I don't know where you want to put it, but it's got to go somewhere else. 
because now it's all gone. Nice move. We can resign. Okay, I got two games left, and this game was pretty great. This is for our own Max, known as Chess Gains. And I was a little prejudiced. I, might, I was thinking not to cover it because it was a little bit of a fast time control. But it was an important game because it was like this collegiate blitz championship stuff. So I said, okay. And I like chess games because he's got those glasses. So I said, all right, we're going to look at this game. I think it was 25 plus some time controls of something. Thank you, Austin, for coming. All right, here we go. End game repertoire, baby. So, knight f3, e4, knight fd2, f5. So, chess games had actually prepped this out. Beautiful. And I will say this is a very rich position. I talked a little bit about it in the video I did. Uh, I do think it's, let's call it dynamically equal or whatever you want to say. Um, but it does make me nervous. <laughs> this position makes me nervous for black because it can become extended quickly and you could quickly get a bad French. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So knight c3, e3. Let's just mention for white that knight b3, trying to get a great French with getting the French bishop out and then closing the door after would have been an interesting try for white. G6, good. C6, like you write, also possible. Rook B1. And you write that he had played B4 in an earlier game. Okay. So, Rook B1. And I think, um, I think it's fair to say that Rook B1 is arguably just a loss of time. I like... in principle either b4 or castles immediately first okay rook b1 a5 now um it's always in in a lot of king's indian positions and in this one as well it's it's always uh difficult to know whether you want to allow a5 now what am i talking about in general it's going to amount white will still get b4 but in one position, the rook will be open. He'll be an opportunistic jerk. Uh, in the other, though, the position will be closed, which also has its virtues. A lot of times the rook doesn't get to do anything anyway. right? So it's a, I'm going to say it's a little bit of a matter of taste. Okay. Um, but in particular, if, if you want to play c6, d5, then... A5 makes me no, more nervous. Now, how you want to put your pieces still is a little bit undecided, at least for me. But you got to see, like, when you play A5 and then play C6, it's more squares that are going to be vulnerable for you on your queen side. And uh, in general, right, let's say the obvious, white's pawns are pointing this way, black's pawns, I know they don't look like they're pointing to the king's side, but they are pointing this way. Um... Why? Because essentially it's a structure with, uh, you know, like you can imagine it like this. Now, that brings us actually to an interesting detail, which is, and this is again something maybe to write about. Uh, how do we feel about this F pawn? It's one of the things that makes me nervous. In a way, of course, it's great because it's protecting our pawn. On the other hand, it's in the way of our bishop. So, for example, if you, if you back it up and you put it on f7, you have the king's Indian attack against the French. And rook b1 in that position, definitely a loss of time. Um, which, you know, Fisher popularized with colors reversed. Okay. a5. Boom. Castles, castles. And now you need a plan, and I want to admit that it's not easy for me either to decide what to do okay so um <laughs> you write about c5 and i like c5 intuitively a lot because first of all with 97 i'm not sure where you're going 
And c5 just has a very simple idea to open the bishop's strength, which is something I really want to do. And there's, we, we, yeah, just makes a lot of sense. And like you said, there you, you had some games where you saw it similar. There's an idea in the King's Indian attack also where white plays c4, colors reversed, um, and you get something similar. So, you know, like I said with this position, it's very rich. Both sides, um, you know, have got things going on. And um, knight d7, I think, is the beginning of your slide, right? So, knight d7, boom, 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 and now you do c5. And we got to say it's much less strong here because, yeah, everything's ripped open for the guy. And let's say the obvious, what does dude want? He wants to rip everything open on the queen side before you just, you know, get any drama going on the king side. So, boom, boom, boom. And I want to give him some props for that. It might not even be the best move to play knight b3. But I like that he didn't just automatically play d5. A lot of people do that with, like, pawns in mind. And you know that pawns aren't people. He plays d5 and he gives your knight the e5 square. Is it still a very interesting struggle? It is. Okay. So, knight b3, b6. I like it. I like it a lot. Knight b5. Okay. You're in trouble. <laughs> Bishop a6. And um, it's definitely an awkward move. And White's played the last couple moves well. And we're starting to see the bummer of knight d7. It has no future. And everybody's bouncing off of each other here, right? If we imagine... The knight on b8, it could go to c6, and that would just be a lot cooler. So bishop a6, and it would be very sad if you gave up your bishop. And unfortunately, we already know, because I've seen ahead in the future, that you give away your bishop. <laughs> and obviously, you don't want to play bishop b7, because you were just there on c8. So right, this is an example where it's hard to find a plan, and... Writing about it, I think, is really important, you know, because uh, it kind of gets back to the mistake of knight d7 and, and the kind of sense of planlessness that I'm sure you felt here, you know. And I guess one hope that you have here, you know, the only thing maybe keeping you hanging on is that that knight on b3 is in the way of white. Boom, simple and strong. Now I gotta suspect he's close to winning. Boom, snip, snip. Notice that his knight is now active. Knight d2. Let me just say queen c2. Why not queen c2, right? Put your queen over there. Talk to the c-pawn, bring your rook in. Looks, looks like it makes sense. This is too fancy. Good move. Weird. Weird. <laughs> Weird. You know, especially in a blitz game, you put your queen on the same diagonal as your king. It's starting to give me a heart attack. Okay. Um, in this position, I think it's good to focus on why you're, like, strategically lost. Um, because your king is loose. You'd have no initiative on the king side. Um and the opposite color bishop, the bishop on e2, he's a real monster. And his pawn, his past pawn, is way more cooler than yours. So I'm trying to say here is where you try to start some drama. You know? And queen e6 isn't it. Knight fd7 is suffering. And maybe that's like the computer's best move or something like that. But just from a practical perspective... I think I would want something like that. You know, is it potentially insane? Maybe, but I you, I guess from my perspective, I see you losing this game uh, if you just sit around, you know, like knight fd7. Worst king, worst pawn, it's a bad business. Okay, so, um, you actually, let's look at your variation. 
You said king h8. Snip, snip, snip that way. Boom, boom, boom. And the qu black queen and knight duo managed to cover all the important squares to deny white entry. Chess gains. I think this position's lost, buddy. No, no. <laughs> I think this one's done. Does he have to work some? It's true. He does. But this one is, this one's a very hard road. Mm hmm. Okay. Let's look at the game. Queen e6. I still got games to cover, my friends. Boom. Um, yeah, did I, I did I appreciate a lot of what White was doing? I didn't. Was it genius level? I don't know. Yeah, you gotta take it, bro. Opposite color bishops, they're the beast. Check the miserable king. I, and for him, I wouldn't necessarily want to trade the queens just because the, the queen can do so much damage when your bishop isn't doing anything. Oh, he took it. Mm. Why, wouldn't, why wouldn't you try to just at least try to keep the a7 square? A7. Okay. So, Max, chess gains. I wish I had more time to spend on that, buddy. Because I kind of talk too long. I always talk too long about Vishnu's game. It's, and in general, like most things in life, this is Vishnu's fault. You blame Vishnu. Okay. So, Tim. Tim actually, he's been on this show loads of times, but he actually won this analysis by David Proust. He's like, if you win a tournament, you can get a game analyzed by Cry. And I was like, well, <laughs> maybe it was just by, by one of us. In any case, um, Bishop G5. And he says, black does not play what I think is the critical setup against the exchange French, the setup with knight c6, knight g7, and castles long. One video I did a while back was, you know, I did the easy system against the French. Basically, you know, I'm a French player and I know how to get inside of our heads. And I broke it down. And one way to do it is to play that easy system. You can check that out. But the other thing is definitely to play the exchange. And I think that this is Black's uh, best setup here. And maybe White is only just a hair better. But the thing that's so evil with the exchange is that a lot of French players aren't comfortable with this kind of symmetry. They want the trench warfare of the French and the little dance that they do, you know. And if you're not comfortable, you will do something radical, like, you know, play knight f3. First of all, white should play knight f3. And then if they play c5, you've got loads of options. Bishop b5 is an advantage for white. And the, advantage, the thing that Tim's talking about goes something like this. And then they play queen d7, castles, and they try to get frisky on your king. And why? Because they're insecure about that symmetrical position and uh, they're going to get wasted on the queen side with the b4, b5, and oh my god, it's over. And I gave that analysis in that video. Pretty basic to understand. And maybe just a couple variations you need to see and it's real trouble for... Um, Black. Okay, so back to the game. Okay, now this is actually a very technical position. Knight d2, knight d7, c3, rook e8, arguably a mistake, rook e8, c6, it might be better. Queen c2, boom, boom. And let me mention bishop e3 is an interesting thought. Um, because then 
were thinking about playing H3 next and maybe getting a little something something. H3, knight, H4. And if it's kind of weird, he's like denying, you know, doesn't want to play C5, C6, which he kind of needs to do. Boom. Boom, boom. Bishop H5, knight E5. Beautiful, Tim. And like I said, this is, I, I mentioned this in the video too. You are looking to play knight E5 and you are definitely doing great in this position. Absolutely wonderful. And um, C5. Boom, boom, and here you criticize g4 and this variation. Let's go through it a little bit. g4, g5, boom, 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 and black is busted. You know, I, I believe that he's busted, but, you know, just looking at first glance, that's not immediately obvious to me. Nor is it immediately obvious to me that that is such a bad move that you did. Bishop b6, that doesn't look right. And you correctly play g4. And he's got to go crazy. Boom, boom. King h1. And you're now it really looks like you're crushing, right? By the way, write it. In the notes, say Bishop is about. Christ says Bishop is about. Christ says, <laughs> Christ says that when you got Bishop is about opposite color, that this thing is winning. Vishnu hates it when he hates my dogmas. He's got like a list of dogmas written down on Twitter, and he's just like, "Well, Christ about to say one of his usual dogmas." Well, they're good dogmas. Here we go. Check to the miserable king, knight d7, and here you write that knight d4 looks winning. Definitely looks winning, and. The feature of the position here to uh, understand is that with queen d2, that he has the queen. And we talked a little bit in another game about how the queen is the best defender. And now terrible, terrible things happen. Knight g4, yikes, check to the miserable king. Boom. And it's a real bummer. And you're right, you got no compensation, which I guess is true. Oh, but actually, let's tell the true story of the game. Uh, queen f6. I was looking for another move when my opponent resigned. Because he ran out of time. What an amazing story. We had two wild resignations, you and Marty. You and Marty are the twins. All right. Let's see what we got here. I need to, we got one more game, I believe, with Ricker. And I'll try to close this out so that we get a, a I don't, you know, it's weird. I started this show and years ago, somebody at chess.com was not even there anymore. He's like, dude, you should do, there's so many people, you should do a three hour show. And, you know, I've always wondered if my voice would withstand it. Some nights I get off and it's just like, oh my God. In <laughs> any case, now for whatever reason, it's in my head to do a three-hour show. So, C B6, a weird move. C4 is good. Good move. Okay, Ricker, let's talk. D5 is in some ways a great move because you're shutting down the bishop. However, it applies what I said earlier about the pawns. In general, they don't want to move. And so some move like bishop E2 would be good. And you know what would really be good is our old friend, Harry the H-Pawn, H4. That looks like a good move. But you're doing great. And that's got to be a mistake, right? So I just tell Ricker's story. Uh, Ricker started chess late. And um, he's, by the way, I always do his game last in these shows because he's way over there in Indonesia. And so it's like, I don't know, it's, 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 it's dark 30, maybe a very early morning. In any case, like a lot of uh, people who started late, it's the tactics are the hard thing to get a hold of. And um, this move, the reason you should be suspicious is just because what you've done when you play d5 is you did kill this guy, and that was great, but then now this guy's your enemy number one, 
as well as the dark squares that you've given him, right? So, um, you know, um, there's many moves that you could do here. You still have very nice spatial control. Uh, H3 is one just to take away the knight G4 maneuver. All right, mistake, good move. And one of the bummers when you have space, by the way, is when they bust out, it can be really dangerous. Now, of course, you're not lost. Boom. Um, I think a clever move here for you, Ricker, and again, this is just something to write about when you're doing your annotations, is to say, to try to first express, like, okay, I lost a pawn, but ask yourself, how bad is it? And one of the interesting things about knight e5 is maybe, but he's also like trading off his good pieces and not fixing the bishop on b7, right? So you need, though, to now say to yourself, all right, how do I create drama? And I guess I'm especially thinking about the king. So the first move that comes to my mind here is definitely rook b3. Now, he's not going to lose the uh, bishop because he can take this with check. It would be great if we could get that bishop because then we'd have this guy. But we'd have here, here, and then we can talk about Harry. And, of course, the dream of this dude is someday he cruises over, and as long as he's developed, then the bishop on c1 is developed. Okay. Is b4 a bad plan? As a plan itself, it's not a bad plan. Um, okay. And that's controversial. c6, excellent move. Why? Because that guy needs to fix his bishop. And now it's not really blunted because what we can say is that it is very active uh, because it's touching the d5 pawn. e6 is a thought. He does queen d7. Snip, snip. e6 is still a thought. And now I guess we got to say he's winning, right? You're making it complicated. Good. And here we have our famous rook endgame. And like I said a number of times, it's in the rook endgame where people are losing it. And that is where you know, we have chess gains on the show. That's where your chess gains are to be had. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're winning. How did it happen? It was almost like magic, right? And I just say, as a chess coach who does a variety of different levels, uh, from absolute beginner to people who are much stronger, it's the rook endgame where I just see the weirdest moves. <laughs> I just see the weirdest things happen. And this is exhibit number A. All right, guys. Um, thank you so much for the show. I got to run. I will be back in a month if you go to our Chess Dojo Discord channel, and you are either a Patreon or a Twitch sub here, then the great Kostya will give you access to our uh, monthly show uh, channel, and there you can post a game, and I will be back. Let's assume it's going to be. We'll post this very soon uh, officially, but I can say mostly officially now it's going to be February 24th, same time, 4 o'clock Eastern. Uh, so take some time, analyze your games, and I'm hoping with this show you can watch it. And whether you've done, uh, uh, done it before or not, you can say, oh, right, this is what Cry is looking for for when we do the annotations. And it really will help your chest more so than anything I say. Just doing the annotations and thinking about what's going on in the game will help you the most. All right, everybody. Bye-bye.